So I'm Dr. Jan Scarlett. I am the director of the Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program here at Cornell. Uh, I am by training an epidemiologist. Everybody says, oh, that must be skin diseases. Well, no, that's dermatology. Epidemiology is the study of populations of uh, diseases in populations of animals. The root word being epidemic, that's how you, how you remember. And what I, so I don't do, I am a veterinarian, but I don't do a lot of clinical work. I have to rely upon Dr. Berliner and people like Dr. Janesco to really help me with the clinical skills, which I had many years ago and have subsequently lost. Um, but what I'm interested in is how do you assess the health of populations? And we want not only want the health of individual, excuse me, individual animals, but they make up the population that you're dealing with. And so you have to talk about the health of animals as well. So we're going to talk about how do we, how do we assess that? And in that process, we're going to use metrics. Um, so before we talk about that, is there anyone in the audience that's with an organization that doesn't have as part of its mission to reduce suffering? Is there anybody here that is with an organization that isn't concerned about reducing animal suffering? That's part of what we're about, right? I mean, that's what we are in this business to do. We want to save lives, but we want to reduce suffering as well. And does disease cause suffering in shelters? I mean, are these animals suffering at some point, even with just, uh, just in quotes, upper respiratory tract infections? They are suffering. And the reason I make that comment is that I think it's incumbent upon all of our organizations to use every tool in our toolbox to fight disease. Because these diseases, especially the upper respiratory ones, are really difficult to deal with. We will never eliminate either the canine respiratory complex or the feline respiratory complex. It's just the nature of those viruses. For those of you who have children in daycare, guess what? You get disease when you put a bunch of mammals in a small space, make them, and, and have them share uh, water, food, air, et cetera, and, and caretakers. Don't forget the caretakers. So one of the tools that I want you to really seriously consider are metrics. In addition to your cleaning and disinfection, in, in addition to your vaccination, it is not alone going to solve your problems. It is one more tool in that toolbox that you're going to use. Um, so what I really like to do today is to really get you to think about, could we do this in our organization? Could we actually use some metrics to augment what we're doing with in infectious diseases? Um, and then I'll give you a couple of examples, simple ones, keeping them very simple, because I don't think they need to be really complicated. I don't think you need a really um, sophisticated computer system or what have you. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, the other thing I really strongly believe that you should be setting health-related goals. Many of you are setting goals for the organization in terms of you know, you wanna, you, you're starting, you're going to do a capital campaign uh, a year from now in order to raise money to build a new shelter. Or you want to, one of your goals is to renovate the kennels because they're not sufficient and the, animal, and the dogs don't have a good place to live. But I also want you to stop and think about, let's set some health goals. How can we make this population healthier to reduce the suffering we talked about a little while ago? And when you do start thinking about goals, then you have to think, don't you? You have to stop and concentrate on, well, what is the health of this population? And I am well aware of the chaotic lives you guys lead. I mean, I, don't, I can't think of a more challenging environment to work in for human beings. You've got always something new is coming out. Something is you have to tend to. You know, the employee doesn't show up. 
uh, somebody's just brought in a dog or cat hit by a car. It's always chaotic. And I know you're working from the time you come in to the time you leave. But unfortunately, when we get into that chaotic environment, what, what, do we, what, what gives? Your time to think. Your time to consider. Your time to think about, geez, what, what's going on in my organization overall? We're just so focused on that, that individual event that's capturing our attention. And if you stop and set some goals, I think that it, that helps you to stop and say, OK, how are we doing? It, are, is one out of three cats that walk through my door going to get sick with an upper respiratory? Or is it only one out of 10 that walks through my door? Um, and it raises awareness on your part, but then you get to talking about your, this with your colleagues, with the staff, and they go, gosh, you know, I never thought about at the, glo at the population level, how many animals are getting sick here? I'm always tending to that individual animal and treating that individual animal. Um, and I think it motivates. Gosh, guys, you know what? Last year, we had 35% of the cats that walk through our door get sick. That's not acceptable. That's a lot of suffering. I want to change that. And most people who are working in shelters are doing it because they love animals and they want to stop the suffering. And so I think you build a team, because it, it's not just one person. It's not just the vet. It's not just the LVT. It's not just your vet. Excuse me. I don't know what's wrong with my throat this morning. Um, it's not just the, uh, the medical staff that's responsible for the health of the animals. Everybody who touches an animal has an impact on the health of that animal, because we can serve as fomites, because those agents like to get on us and go from one animal to another via us. So we want a team approach to disease control. And then, then, it, then it begs the question, doesn't it? How could we? How could we lower the incidence of disease in this shelter? What are the strategies we're going to use? And then, by gosh, we're going to look back and see if those strategies worked. And that's where we, we as veterinarians and, and all of us fall down. We implement a change. We adopt a new disinfectant. We go from using bleach to trifectant. And, and then, do we know it works? Do we know we're doing a better job? How would we know that? Some of that is going to be with your metrics, is looking at how did we do? We did 35% of our animals got sick last year. This year, we've reduced that to 29%. We're making progress. Fewer of our animals are getting sick. Okay. So it's really important to take time to think and to plan. And I know how hard that is. Carve it out time to do that and protect that time. Okay. Um, we won't talk about, you can have a whole lecture on goal setting. But when you set goals, and, and I'm going to talk specifically about health-related goals, but it applies to any goals. We like the SMART approach. And if you Google SMART, you'll get, it'll, it'll come up. And it's used very widely in business. Is it the only one? No, of course not. But these are some guidelines on how to set goals. They have to be very specific. I want to reduce, not just I want to reduce the amount of disease in the shelter. I want to go after reducing it by 8% this year. And set your goals high. Not so high you can't achieve them, because then you're going, to get, you're going to get discouraged. But set them high enough that it challenges you. Because if it's important enough, then you ought to make it challenging, um, measurable. How are you going to figure out whether you, in fact, achieved the goal? Not all of goals need to be metrically measured. Some of them could be, um, you know what, we're really unhappy with this disinfectant. By, by the beginning of next month, we're going to try a new disinfectant. And you can measure that. By the beginning of next month, have we, in fact, ordered and gotten that task done? Um, it has to be achievable. I mean, make it realistic, challenging but realistic. It has to be relevant to the situation. Um, you know, I, geez, I don't like the color of the outside of the shelter. Uh, let's, let's paint it blue. 
well, is that relevant in the grand scale, so long as the rest of it's not falling off and, and you're, 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 it's just the color you want to change, is that really relevant to a good use or shepherding of your, of your uh, limited resources? So make it relevant to the problem you're trying to solve. And then put a time limit on it. Because if you've got a time, what do we do? We procrastinate, right? If we don't have a time limit and we don't know that we are accountable, everything else creeps in. I mean, even if you don't mean to consciously procrastinate, it means that something else is going to fill that void. So gosh darn, by the next time we meet, we are going to have this done. And, and then make somebody accountable. Make somebody who needs to crack the whip, because we're all just too busy. Somebody has to say, wow, I'm the one who's going to be called on the carpet if I don't have this done, or I don't have a good explanation for why it's not done. Um, so how do we know if a population is healthy? Um, what are the signs of an unhealthy population? Anybody want to take a guess? How would you know whether this is a healthy population or an unhealthy population? A little bit of a subjective question, I understand, but just in general. Behavior, if there's no physical symptoms, maybe behavior can be indicative of, of an so, so, you know, if you've got sick looking animals, for example, but beyond just an individual animal, how would you know the population is healthy? They're happy. They're, they're happy. Not the individual animal, not just one. That's right. And how can we get a, an assessment of that? I already kind of gave you a couple of examples. We, we talked about 35% of the cats walking through the door develop URI. Is that likely to be a healthy population? I mean, even though you don't have something as a baseline? I mean, does that not seem high to you regardless? That's a lot of cats getting sick. You know, one out of three every cat that walks through the door of every hundred is going to get sick in your care. That, that's an unhealthy population. And what is the absolute lowest? I don't know. I think it really depends on your, on your circumstances, what your, what your facilities are like or whatever. But I think we can get down to around 15% of cats. If we're doing that, we're pretty good. Are we healthy? Probably not healthy, healthy. But it, there's going to be some limit. You're always going to have some upper respiratory disease. But if you're up around 30, 25, you're, you've got too many, or higher, you've got too many cats getting sick in your shelter. And you can do better. And that's the goal. It's to do better than what you're doing. We are not going to completely eliminate respiratory. But we can do better in most shelters. Um, and then how do you know if you have an outbreak? Have you ever thought about that? You know, what, what's the definition of an outbreak? When my quarantine room is full. When, well, I'm there you go. Sick. When they're, yeah, at, when, my quarant well, when my isolation room is full and they're still getting sick. So what is it? It's an increased frequency of disease above that which you usually see. That's an outbreak. You're in trouble if now you're going along, you usually have this amount of disease, and then it spikes. OK? We got to know what you usually have, right? Now, that will hit you in the face if you get panleukopenia or parvovirus. But upper respiratory, nah, it really has to get pretty dramatic. The difference between 25 and 30 percent, if you're not tracking it, may not be evident to you. So assessing the, the really has to do with frequency of disease predominantly. But we can, we can assess the population level of disease at various levels. So it could be overall, out over all our cats. But we could look at that by age. How are our kittens doing compared to our adult cats? And, and that can help you because you may have a fairly low rate of disease in your adults, but your kittens are very sick. And when you combine the two, you may not notice how much disease. So we, we encourage you, as you get comfortable with looking at some of these metrics, to look at it by other factors like that, that often impact on disease, like age, like source, owner surrendered versus stray, uh, by potentially by location in your shelter. 
Sometimes we have some wards or some, or uh, we were in a shelter where there was more disease with one caretaker because she was rougher. She wasn't, you know, I'm not talking about mean or anything. She was just rougher handling of the cats. And there was actually a noticeable difference in the URI rates in her shelter or in her ward compared to this other woman who was very, very calm, just knew all the cats, spent some time with them. And so things like that can happen within your shelter. And as you get used to working with the metrics, this is me talking, but I hope that you can I, I convey some of the enthusiasm. You can get excited about that. Because now you're suddenly discovering things that you never realized before. Um, and, and then of course, you know, once you start seeing things, my kittens are really have a higher rate of disease than our adult cats. What's going on? Then you can problem solve that, right? Why? The question comes, why? Why are our kittens doing so badly? And then you focus your efforts there instead of working with the, I'm not, you don't ignore the adult cats, but you, you concentrate on those areas that are, are most trouble to you. Um, and then you can make your plans, you can monitor the success with your goal setting, and and then share the results. And I really feel strongly, you need to share it with everybody in the shelter. Look what we've done. People care. They want to be a part of helping to keep those animals healthy. All right, so now we get to play with fun with clickers. So hopefully you all have clickers. And you need to turn them on. And there should be a little button. Now, is there anybody who, when they go to turn it on, it looks like the battery's dead? Yeah. Oh, are we? We're out of them anyway. Oh, I, I apologize. So, <laughs> so when I say it's the polling is open, you get to choose. Uh, and what I didn't do, guys, I'm sorry about this. Is it should say A. A is yes. B is no. C is don't know. E is it's not applicable to me. OK, sorry about that. I should have foolishly didn't put A, B, C, and D. So easy enough, A is yes, B is no, C don't know, uh, D not applicable. OK, so I'm going to open the polling. And you guys, please, everybody tell me, does the shelter with which you are affiliated collect and computerize medical data? Uh, yeah, any medical related data. So yes, vaccines would count in that. If, you're, if you enter you know, use of antibiotics or medications, anything that's medically related. So good, most of you are using some kind of computerized medical system. Uh, do you need to do that? We'll talk about that. No, if you don't, if you're not using a computer or a computerized software, you can still do this. So I want to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay. So I want to make a, a point about the difference in the terminology. This comes from the smart, the smart uh, nomenclature. But they talk about objectives as being something like that's in your broad mission. So part of your mission might be, and I, we've already talked about this, reducing the suffering. So an objective is a broad uh, goal that's not very specific, very general, but something you're striving to do as part of the mission of your shelter. Um, a goal, by their definition, is, is that thing that's very specific that you set. You may have multiple goals to help you achieve your objective. And you will initiate a goal, define a goal, initiate it, hopefully resolve it, or if you don't, figure out why you didn't, and then set a new goal and go on. So it's an ongoing, repetitive pro process. I strongly believe at the population level, if you don't set goals, then you're likely to stay where you are. And it's a, I mean, I don't think we've ever been in a shelter that they couldn't improve the overall population health of the animals in their shelter. 
Um, and again, make them specific. Reduce the incidence of URI. Decrease the median length of stay. We know that the longer a dog or cat spends in your shelter, the more likely it is to get sick. And, and that should make sense to you. It just it has to do with, uh, with exposure and the likelihood of being exposed at some point. So the longer you're there, the less likely or more likely you are to get sick. So anything we can do, it is a powerful approach to reducing disease, minimize the length of stay. And Dr. Berliner is actually going to speak to strategies that can help you minimize that length of, of stay. Um, so let's open the polling again. Does the shelter set specific health-related goals right now? So go for it. A is yes, B, no, C, don't know, et cetera. Good. I'm, I'm really pleased that, to see that. Because uh, many shelters we go in, they don't set health-related goals. And, I'm, and for those of you who don't really contemplate, really consider, if nothing else, your homework assignment is to go back and at least talk about it with your shelter. And see if you can rally some support for really setting specific and time-bounded goals with regards to uh, health. Um, so let's just kind of brainstorm uh, a situation. And I, and I made this up, it, and I'm, I'm going to you know, take some liberties with it because I know it's not quite as simple as I'm making it, but I just want to illustrate the point. But let's say that, you know what, you're really unhappy with the amount of disease you see in the, in the months Ju July through September. And I made it this time frame so that you guys can go back and actually think about, could we do this this year, right now? Um, but you know, there are a lot of key things. These are, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are key things in many shelters that will help to reduce URI. So we already talked about length of stay and the importance. Overcrowding. You get more animals in a shelter, guess what? You get more disease for all kinds of reasons. But one is agent load, more animals to shed into the environment, less time for your people to clean, to let that disinfectant stay on. Um, you know, people are harried. They're trying to go from animal to animal. They don't do as well a job as they usually do in terms of biosecurity on themselves. All kinds of reasons. Very strong. Those two are very strong predictors of high levels of disease. All your biosecurity measures, your cleaning, your disinfection, um, reduction of fomite, education of your staff. They are key. They are your front line, your first defense against upper respiratory disease. Um, and then stress. Let's say, all right, so the other point I want to make is if you don't know how much was there last year, how are you going to know whether you've improved, gotten worse, or whatever this year? So for those of you who have the information from last year, then you're going to try to do the same thing this year and compare it. For those of you who do not have information last year, next year you will, because you're all going to go home and, and in fact, calculate these rates. OK? Um, Define the time frame. We've, we've already laid that out. And then we're going to count cats that get sick in this interval. So if they're healthy when they come in, or they're healthy at the beginning of July, then they're at risk of getting sick. And so we're going to only count those that get sick for this calculation. Okay. And then we're going to keep track of the cats that come in that are at risk of getting sick. Now, ideally, you'd like to pull out the cats that come in sick already with upper respiratory because they're not at risk of getting sick, again, in this interval at least. And in most shelters, the number of cats that get sick twice with URI, unless you have very long lengths of stay, are really, really small in relation. So we've got to make this practical. Okay. And then um, we keep, in, keep in mind that the cats that are still in your shelter on July 1, that are there, that happen to be resident on July 1, if they don't have URI on July 1, they're also at risk because they're still there. Right? They're still there in your shelter. 
So what we're going to do is then calculate what we call an incidence rate. It's a probability estimate for those of you, although I don't want to scare anybody, but it's the probability that if you come in healthy, that you will get sick in this interval, that you will develop URI in this interval. And it, it's, it's really not that hard to do. Now, you have to, you have to pay some attention. You're going to have to count cases now of URI that are newly developed in that interval. And then your denominator is where you're going to have to work a little bit harder, but most of you have intake information. You know how many cats came in. You might have to start tracking who's in your infirmary. And you could do this even, you could do this on, with pencil and paper. What's my census? For those of you who've got pet point or these other, what, you can get a census for a day. Okay, so you know what your census was. Now you may have to keep track of who's in your infirmary. And worst comes to worst, you know, if you don't take out the animals that were in the infirmary already or came in sick, in most of your cases, unless you've got a whole lot of disease, you're really not going to affect the rates tremendously. Uh, ideally, you want to do this, though. So we're going to take those 27 cats that came in with URI right out of the denominator. They're not at risk of getting URI because they've already got it. And we're going to take the 15 that were in the infirmary on July 1. We're going to take them out of the denominator because they're not at risk of getting URI. So now we have a denominator of 723. 123 cats got sick in that interval. And they divide the two, and that's an incidence rate. That's a probability. That's the probability that your cat walking through your door is going to get sick come in that interval. This isn't really hard. And the, if you think about it, it's the principle I want you to take away. It's newly developed cases in the interval divided by who is at risk of getting sick. Now, you can make this more complicated. Well, are they vaccinated or not? Va but you still, regardless, you want to know I don't care if they're vaccinated or not, because these vaccines for especially upper respiratory don't protect against disease. They, they, are, they do protect, they lower the incidence of disease. They don't protect against infection, okay? Any questions about that before I go on? Because this, this is what I want you to try to do. And it's, it's easier if you have a computerized program and you know how to use it. Um, if you don't know how to use it and you're, do, you're still entering this information, then do it by hand. Use an Excel program, use a notebook. And you don't have to do every disease. I mean, I would have you start with, with respiratory diseases because they're the most common and the most vexing in most shelters. And once you do this on a regular basis, uh, we like to, to just put it into an Excel program. And for those of you who, do, who, the, you, who yourselves are not really good at Excel, you've got kids or you've got younger people <laughs> who know how to use Excel. And they can create simple graphs for you. And, and you can actually see changes that are going on visually, not only just in the numbers. OK. Um, you could just count the cases. That, but if you do that and don't have a denominator, you're making the assumption that the, the, the denominator is essentially the same this year as last year, or this month as last month. And it may or may not be true. But I would encourage you, even if you don't want to do the denominator stuff, to do the enumerator stuff, because I still think that's going to give you a better sense. Last year, we had 148 cats, get, or 150 cats get sick. This year, it was down to 125. So even doing that, I prefer the rates, but even doing that, I think, gives you a handle, a much better handle on how much disease you have at the population level. All right, so another poll. Uh, does your shelter keep track of the rates of URI uh, in cats over time in your shelter? So go for it. So not, not as many of you do. That doesn't surprise me. I'm really happy, though. 24%, quarter of you are keeping track of the rates. That's wonderful. I'm really excited about that. I'm hoping that I can excite some of the rest of you to do the same thing. Good, 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 good. Um, so now you've got more disease, more URI than you want to do. Now you've got a plan, right? You've got to figure out, well, what are we going to do? I've got more than I want to. I want to lower that rate. What am I going to do? So think about, in your shelter, this causes you again to stop and think, what 
factors do you think are most contributing to the risk of upper respiratory in your shelter right now? And I would, I think it's sometimes easier to say the, one, the top one or two, because if you try to do everything all at once, usually you don't do any of them really well. So target and think about what are the factors that are most influential on the rates of URI in my shelter right now. And then, how am I going to affect the change to lower the rates? What's my, what's my strategy going to be? And, it, and, and I encourage you to have teams to do this, because it's not usually just one person. You want to get people involved in this. So let's just make up the example, and I'm, I'm not, it, this may not be true for your shelter at all. But let's say one of the things you really feel strongly about is you don't have a good stress reduction program in your shelter for your cats. They come in, people don't put uh, in, uh, towels over, they don't provide hide boxes, or you don't have a good enrichment program. And stress is very important, especially in upper respiratory disease. Because herpes virus in cats is, in fact, activated by stress. So let's just assume that you do this. And you make a plan and you go ahead and do this. And now you're going to have to say, when am I, when am I going to implement these changes by? These changes are going to happen in a week from now. And we're going to start doing these. Um, when will these strategies be implemented? When will they be completed? When, when will we look again? I mean, and not the strategies, but when will we look again to see whether we have, a, uh, you know, have an effect? on the right. And you have to involve, I really think you need staff buy-in. You can, this is going to sound terrible, but I think you can make a game of this, not a game in a, you know, in a but, but a goal-driven, can we reduce the amount of disease in our shelter? We're going to have a pizza party if we get it reduced in 2% in six months and then 5% in a year. Do something to motivate people. Um, and then count. I don't, However you do it, keep track of the cases that develop. In Pet Point, there are condition um, uh, pla places where you put in the condition. Go ahead and do that. And then you can pull it back out. Uh, and then keep track of your denominator. Okay. Um, so you can, if, if you in fact find no difference, then at the end of your interval, between the two years you're comparing, or between the two time frames you're comparing, then the question is why? Was that, did we, did we miscalculate? That is, that stress wasn't one of the big factors in our shelter? Did we not implement the plan appropriately? Do we have people who are not conforming to or complying with the changes we made? But it, again, makes you stop and think, doesn't it? If it did decline, celebrate, set new goals. Try to push it even lower. Um, if, it, if it increased, uh-oh, what's going on? What's broken down? What's wrong? Did something, we, we did a good job with the stress reduction, but by gosh, now we've got you know, four new people hired and they're not doing as good a job of, of disinfecting. But it focuses your attention on that, and keeps your attention on the disease levels in your shelter. So here's a shelter uh, that, that Dr. Berliner was working with where, in fact, the initial goal was to lower the median length of stay because we had cats staying. The median is the middle most when you don't have data that's normally distributed. That doesn't matter. It's like an average, except that it really is the middle if you've got badly skewed data. And so that means that half of the cats were staying less than 33 days in the shelter. Guess what? Half of the cats were staying more than 33 days. That's a very long length of stay. So the goal was to reduce length of stay. So in fact, in a year, in, in using many of the strategies that Dr. Berliner is going to talk to you, we lowered that rate to 25. Guess what happened to our daily census over that time frame? It subsequently dropped as well. And then, wonderfully, look what happened to the rates of upper respiratory disease. Dramatically declined. Um, all right, last polling question. I don't want to go over time. All right, um, so does your shelter have a commercial software package that helps you track 
um, information, disease information. Commercial package, pet point, <laughs> chameleon, shelter buddy, um, there are a number of others that could help you make this just a little bit easier. Good. So, so now you've got to familiarize yourself with how to get the data out of there. Okay, I mean, I understand, we've been working with PetPoint just because our shelters that we work with have PetPoint. I know it isn't always user friendly. I know it can be a problem. Um, hmm? Well, it's always changing, and yes, I understand. They're trying to improve, which is what we all want to do, but then it's changing, and then no sooner do you learn something, and then you've got to relearn it. Um, but if you get if you can put some time and effort, and, and please feel free to email us. We're learning, too. We do not have all the answers, but we're learning also how to optimize this, because a long-term goal is to make it really easy for you guys to get to pet point and say, just press this button and you get this. And that's the ultimate goal. Um, but I'm really pleased to see that, that many of you have this. But again, I just want to reemphasize, if you don't, you can still do this. This is not rocket science, all right? I mean, you really can do this. Okay. Um, so, just some insights, though. Because garbage in, garbage out in the computer, right? If the data aren't of good quality, then what you get back out, you can't count on. It's not going to be really effective. So you do have to spend some time. You have to have clear definitions of what is URI. Now, that one's not really hard. But again, for people that you may be training or bringing in who don't know what upper respiratory is, then you need to give them some guidance as to what that is and what your definition of URI is. Things like age. You're a kitten, juvenile, adult, or senior. You know, those are words, or we use those words. What do they mean? What's a kitten in shelter A compared to shelter B? If you have staff at the front desk, and they change depending on the shift, what does it mean to them, even within your own organization? We strongly, strongly encourage you in your, in, your, in your computer programs to put some age ranges on there. A kitten is anything that is four months and younger in your shelter. I'm, I'm, you can make it what you want. I'm not trying to, but, but then if you're five to uh, nine months, you're a juvenile. But put that actually on there so that people know what that means. At least you get some standardization. Does it mean that, you know, we all know it's not really easy to age a lot of animals. But at least you've got everybody trying to do the same thing. And so you know what it means. Um, and, and work with the person that helps set this up for you. Because sometimes what the staff know about the setup and what the person who set it up knows is true isn't the same. So you got to know how to use your, your database. Um, so you got to really be familiar with your, your package. Um, just a comment. When you're doing your denominators, it depends on, and this is peculiar to your setup and to the software that you're using. But some software packages will have this category service in or, and clinic in. You will see those. And they're used to track animals that come in, like animals that come in temporarily on a TNR program. And they're not at risk. They're coming in, getting surgery, and going back out. They're not the ones that you're worried about in your denominator. So you need to be sure that you have, you, when you look at your intake statistics, you know what goes into that intake statistic. And then who of those are you interested in in terms of their risk of developing disease. And you can subcategorize this, certainly. I mean, you could say, well, what, how, what is, what's the uh, URI rate or what's the parvovirus rate in our seized animals? You could look at that specifically and only pull that out as your denominator. You know, as you get accustomed to doing this, you can subset and really start taking a closer and closer look at subpopulations and their risk for disease. Um, just some examples. Here's an, the, the example on the uh, lower left for you shows the increase in risk of disease with time and shelter. That's upper respiratory in cats. Dramatic. That's why we say. But you can start looking at, you know, and, and this was a shelter that used this rather vague terminology, but you can get a sense of, you know, what's the risk in each age group? 
just some examples. You could, you could start looking at how long when an animal comes in and is sick and is in our infirmary, what's the, what's the average length of stay there? How long, you know, how much time do they tie up uh, space in the infirmary? How, is it seven days? Is it 20 days? Is it, it, and can we do, again, looking for places where you could intervene and potentially make a difference and lower and make it more acceptable. Time to cure. And these are just a ideas for you. I, I would love you just to start with counting, just counting upper respiratory disease. But as you get comfortable with that, or if you're already doing that and comfortable with that, start, start looking more carefully at the data. Um, again, you know, specify your questions carefully. Because your intake is probably includes foster care animals. Well, they're out in the, in, their, in the home, so their risk may be different. Don't make it, start off first uncomplicated, then you can start getting a little bit more and more specific. But think about it. Um, and then changing definitions in your database. It is good to improve your definitions. I don't want to discourage you from that, but when you do that, record it. Keep a log of the changes that are happening in your shelter. I mean, that's good for you whether you're looking at metrics or not, but it's going to help you. Oh, geez, we went from a open admission to a no-kill on July 1, 2001. That's going to make a huge difference in your live release rate, right? So you know that, and you can say, well, I know that. I'll remember that. But 10 years later, when the staff's all changed, there's no, there's no history there in many shelters. So please try to keep track of that stuff, because it'll help you interpret the data that you're seeing. Um, and, and then ask questions about the data. You know, does this really look right? Is this, is this likely? Because sometimes it's a problem with the data and not a reflection of what actually happens in your shelter. So you've got to have your thinking caps on. Um, and then accuracy and completeness. If, if a third of your animals have no information about age, then you start worrying about well, am I really looking at, I mean, did I lose all the kittens because people felt really uncomfortable about trying to age them? I mean, that's a silly example because you probably do a best job there. But um, the point is try to get complete, as complete data as you can, making sure that your staff are entering that data the way you want it to be entered. Um, and then, of course, accurate. And then I really think that you can share this with your board. We have, you know, 35% of our cats are coming in or getting sick. I need more resources. I need more staff because the staff are so rushed, they're not doing a good job of cleaning. Um, metrics speak very loudly to people. Now, I don't want you to misuse them because you can always misuse statistics, right? But if you have an accurate reflection of what's going on in your shelter, you can compete for resources at the shelter level because nobody wants those cats to, or the dogs to suffer. And play that card. These cats and dogs are suffering when they get sick. Make no mistake about it. And by gosh, we need more money to, for our medical program. You know, in addition to, you know, out paint, you know out, outweighing the painting of another color on the shelter. Okay. So really, I want you to force yourself to try to think about using the metrics. Um, data collection is time consuming and expensive. Don't do it for its own sake. And I really, really believe this. I mean, I don't want you to collect everything under the sun about medical information. I want you to collect only that information that you are going to use, and it's going to influence your thinking and actions. Somehow we have this like, oh, we got this computer program, and it takes all this data. I'm going to put all this data in, and I might need it someday. Um, yeah, right. How often do you ever get around to, to, to using it? How often do you get around to using it? And, and the more you put in, the more time it takes, the sloppier people generally get. And so put in what you need, you're going to use, and then use it, but make sure it's complete and accurate. Okay. Um, complete and accurate. And then train. You've got to have people trained well to enter data. And you've got to, make it, you've got to make an impression on the staff that this is something that's very important to do. And, and the quality of what you do here actually impacts the health of these animals. Many times they see it as busy work. You know, because they're busy. I mean, they, they've got lots of other things to do. And I think if they understand that it's not just busy work, that it really will and can impact the health of the animals in that shelter and help you folks 
you know, use that data to set goals to really monitor what's happening, I think we can get better compliance of it, with it. So our goal is to provide the best welfare for animals in our shelters. And that, th that includes minimizing disease and minimizing suffering. And this is one more tool that you guys can use to help do that. So I um, hope you all, my take home message is at least go home and think about it. And I hope some of you will really start to, to do this. Okay, uh, I want to thank Maddie's Fund as always. We would not exist were it not for the Maddie's Fund. And um, of course the ASPCA for putting on this conference and all my colleagues who work with me. Um, and then of course the shelters, because we showed you some data. Those were data, those were real data that were shared with us by shelters. Um, and so we really appreciate their willingness to, to uh, uh, allow us to use that information to, um, to learn.